if you've been around Calvary for any length of time at all, you've probably heard me mention that it was on an Easter Sunday night years ago that I came back to Christ. And it's absolutely changed everything. It's just, it's changed my whole life. And I can never look back. I could never go back to just getting high all the time and trying to figure out just how to live life and how to go forward and that sense of shame and guilt and that that subtle pain that's always running in the background is gone. It's gone. I didn't typically go to church. That wasn't part of my lifestyle, part of my weekly routine. But I went that Sunday and connected not only with the Lord, but with people. Because I had a different idea of Christians, and maybe you're a guest, you're looking around going, still got that idea. <laughs> and, and we're kind of goofy, kind of quirky sometimes. But you know what? I met people who uh, had been cha- Something was different. Something was different about them. And what I thought I was resigned to, what I thought that well, this is just the way my story's going to play out, um, that wasn't the last word. Uh, everything was different and continues to be different. And uh, the road didn't get any smoother, uh, which is one of the things I was kind of hoping for. Still go through heartaches and, you know, all the stuff of life. Um, and it's bumpy, but he's there. He's there with me. And uh, I praise him for that. You know, I was reading earlier this week about the words of famous last Wait, famous last words of people, of famous people, last words of famous people. It's just, okay. It's kind of a rabbit hole while I'm studying. I realized, you know, I went down this and I read like a ton of these and just kind of got caught up in that because there's so many out there. And I began to think about what do I need to say? I need to say something really cool, you know, at that last moment. And I'm sure I'll say something like, shut the door or, you know, not anything very remarkable. But this is really interesting to me because I think there is this thing in us, there's this tendency where we want to have the last word, you know, whether it's in an argument, whether it's in a conversation with your spouse, you kind of want to get in the last word. And I'm looking at these very last words of these people, and some were touching and tender, just really sweet. Some were humorous some angry, and, and some people tried with their last words to get in the last word. i just uh, g- just give you a couple of examples. Karl Marx was at the edge of death, and his housekeeper asked him, do you have any last words? And he said, go on, get out. Last words are for fools who haven't said enough already. Those were his last words, and he died. Marie Antoinette stepped on her executioner's foot on her way to the guillotine and said in English, oh, excuse me, sir. (laughs) Those were her last words. When General John Sedwick, who was a Union commander, was told that the enemy was stationed not too far away, He dismissed the report, and he said this, they couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. And a bullet prevented him from finishing the sentence. And those were his last words. And I'm sure if he has ancestors here, they don't appreciate you laughing at that. I'll just do one more. Lady Nancy Astor awoke briefly in the final stages of her terminal illness. And when she saw that she was surrounded by all her friends and family, she said, am I dying or is this my birthday? Those were her last words. I'm tempted to go with like a lot of modern day, like Elvis and all these other people. I'll let you look them up for yourself sometime when you're, you know, just bored. But we have this need to get in the last word. And sometimes the last word gets us. We live in a world that thinks it's gotten the last word on us. It's got 
can't see. Uh, and that's still a very good reason. Today, there's Jesus. Today is Easter, and this is the day that as Christians we celebrate. You could call it Resurrection Day. Today is the day that we celebrate the fact that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus did something extraordinary, something that had never happened before and has never happened again since. After dying extremely violent death on a cruel Roman cross, he was laid in a cold, dark grave. And all his enemies believed at that moment that it was over. We finally dealt with this guy. They thought they had the last word. But on the third day, the stone securing his tomb was rolled away and Jesus of Nazareth emerged alive and victorious, fulfilled every prophecy. And that's why we're here today. It's not to honor a dead man or a system of religious traditions or merely remember a good teacher. We're here to worship the living Son of God, the Lord, our King. Easter morning is affirmation that all those things we thought might have the last word in our lives don't have the last word after all. And it's because of the resurrection. Everything about us hinges on the resurrection. Today we're going to look at a, at a passage uh, close to where we were last week. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul talks about the significance of the resurrection. You see, in the ancient world, most people believed in a pseudo-spiritual type of afterlife. And sometimes I think, you know, that we look around and you read a new book or you hear someone and they think they've come up with this new idea and here's a different way to look at spiritual things. If you go back, uh, and I kind of keep an eye on that sort of thing, but you know what, I hadn't seen anything new. I mean, this is... Even in ancient days, people uh, came up with these, these alternative ideas. And this one, uh, which was very popular, taught, I guess you'd say, that, it, that it, our souls lived on in another plane. But in their view, whatever happened in this life was disconnected and you know, was irrelevant to, in any way to the next life. It's just another realm of existence. And this kind of thinking made its way over time. It, it, it seeped in from the culture into the church. And we see that now. I mean, we would call it I don't, liberalism or whatever, but we see these ideas that, that kind of get adopted and, and somehow merge themselves and attach themselves uh, to the family of Christ. There were some who didn't even believe in the resurrection. And you think this is kind of weird. You think, well, you're a follower of Jesus and you're a Christian? Yes, I've met, I've met, maybe you're someone who would say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, but nah, don't really buy into the resurrection. It's just hard for me to get. You see, they, did, they would insist that Jesus didn't physically rise from the dead. They, they spiritualized it. And they would say, oh, it was just a spiritual, it was just a ghostly type of resurrection. You know, he just moved from this realm to the next realm, just like we're all going to do. And that's, you know, but 
what is that? And that's, that's, not a, that's not resurrection, is it? I mean, that's not real. So Paul said, hey, that's not how it happened. And he emphasized that Jesus physically rose from the grave. On Friday, his body was dead, dead, dead as it could be. But on Sunday morning, that body was alive again. Not just a spiritual body, not a ghost or a phantom, none of that, but a real physical body that still bore the wounds of the crucifixion. And with his physical body, he walked on the road and he talked with people and, and he ate with people and hundreds of witnesses were there. He invited his friends, touch me, look at me. It was a physical body. It was Jesus and he's alive. But it was more than just an earthly body. It was now a resurrected body made alive by the Spirit of God, a body that will never again experience death. And Paul said Christ is the first to experience this miraculous resurrection, but all of us who follow him will one day experience it too. It means... That Jesus is exactly who he claimed to be. None of this patronizing, he was a good teacher, he was a moral guy, maybe even a prophet. I mean, we like Jesus. He's, you know, no, he says, it's not, it's, it's not that. He is who he said he was. He claimed to be the way and the truth and the life. He claimed to be the only way to the Father. And then he proved it by overcoming death. No religious leader or teacher had ever done that before. The resurrection also means that there's nothing in this world whose power is greater than the power of Jesus. Not even death could hold him. When you believe in the resurrection of Jesus, I can tell you firsthand, it changes everything. It changed how I perceive the world around me, how I perceive the meaning of my own existence, how I perceive day-to-day -day life. All those old filters were removed, and, I, and I, could, I could see. The resurrection changes everything because it changes who really gets the last word. Today, as we consider what the resurrection means for us, I want to talk about three. And those of you who think, that is such a stereotype, that is such a... Preacher, yeah, well, I organize my thoughts this way. There's three things I think are not last anymore. And it's all because of today. It's all because of Easter. So the first thing I want you to see is that Easter means that our troubles don't get the last word. Paul said in his letter uh, to the church there in Corinth in verse 19, he said, If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are, of all people, most to be pitied. He said, if, there, if there's no resurrection and if this is it, we're ridiculous. We're making fools of ourselves. We're pathetic. But why would he say that? You know, he's not saying that there's nothing good in this life. He's not saying there's no reason to have joy. He's not saying, I don't want you to be happy or to seek fulfillment. He's not saying... You're never going to experience answer to prayer or see a miracle or receive blessings in this life. That's not what he's talking about. He is, however, acknowledging that the life of discipleship, of fellowship, 
is for those who are serious about following Jesus can be difficult. Sometimes there's a price to be paid. That's because we have struggles, and I don't want to sound like a crybaby Christian or, you know, be all whiny about, oh, now that I'm a Christian, I can't do that, and I've got to live like this. But, but it changed. We impose a standard on ourselves that others don't impose on themselves. Why would you? If I didn't believe in Jesus, if I didn't believe in the resurrection, if I thought maybe there's not even a God, I may be moral just for the sake of trying to get along. I may still drive on the right-hand side of the road because everybody else is, but by whose authority, who can tell me what to do? Why would I even be motivated? Paul is saying, you know, that living the Christian life involves an investment now, and, and it doesn't fully pay off yet. Uh, we make a lot of counterintuitive choices every day of our lives, right? I mean, because we live with an eternal perspective. It's not just about today. It's not just about tomorrow. We forgive when we could seek revenge. That's one of the ways I was first tested. A, a guy stole some car parts, some high-performance parts, and they were pretty expensive from me. I knew who he was. And the old guy, the old me, I would have burned his house down, poisoned his dog, stolen his woman. I mean, I would, I don't know, I would just, I, okay, I would have gotten revenge I went over to his house and knocked on his door, and he came to the door, and he's like, oh, you know, and I said, I just want you to know, I, I, think, you're the, I think you took these, and, and I forgive you. The Lord had just really dealt with me about this, and it was this contest. It was this moment, a defining moment in my life when I had to decide, am I going to be a different person now, or am I going to keep doing the things the same way? And forgiveness was this huge principle. We give in to those we, you know, we, we, we give and we share with those in need. We could spend, spend the money on ourselves. Why not? We sacrifice for the good of others when we could instead look out for number one. That's what I'd always done. We take a stand for what is right when we could just stay quiet and go along with the crowd and blend in. We do these kind of things because we're making an investment in eternity. When we go through struggles and, and pain, we need to remind ourselves that our troubles don't get the last word. Jesus does. Even when your life is at its worst, and maybe you're there, and I know in a room like this, we've got all kind of troubles, right? I mean, we're going through circumstances and situations. For some, it's relationship or it's about your health or finances, and there's all these things. But we can face it each day knowing that this world isn't all there is. That this isn't it. And this world doesn't get to have the final say on anything. Jesus got the last word on Easter morning. And that's why we celebrate. When you forgive, when you give, and when you love, and when you show mercy, and when you obey, and when you take a stand, there's nothing useless or futile about that. Every day of perseverance is an investment in eternity. And whatever trouble you're facing right now, you can be sure it's not going to get the last word. All right, that brings me to the second idea about a last word that really isn't last at all. Easter means that sin doesn't get the last word. Paul wrote in verse 21, For as by a man came death, 
by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. The resurrection of Jesus reversed the curse that Adam brought on the human race through his disobedience, his choice all the way back in the garden when he said, you know what, I don't want to live my life under your authority. I, don't want, to I want to do this myself. I don't, I don't need you. I just need me. And we in the human race have patterned our lives in the same way. We've made that same choice. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. Romans 10, 17 says, There's none righteous. No, not one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And this is the human dilemma that none of us can escape. We've all sinned. And we've all been broken by that sin. And every life bears the evidence of that brokenness. Now, most people don't deny they've sinned. Uh, the first time a friend of mine who was a follower of Jesus asked me how to ever sinned, I just thought, <laughs> it's like, what well, does a swimmer get wet? Uh, does I mean, you just go on with it. I mean, uh, yeah. I don't deny that. What I tried to figure out were solutions to that on my own. We have no choice to say, yeah, I'm like a sheep, and I just kind of go my own way. I do what I want to do. That includes me. I want to hear how Isaiah finishes that verse. Okay, in Isaiah 53, 6, he says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each, every one, to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What does that mean? It means while Jesus was dying alone on the cross, all the sins that have ever been committed, your sins, my sins, all the sins of everyone who ever lived, was placed on him. It's incredible. He paid whatever price those sins deserved. And any power that those sins ever had, any claim that they may have had on you, died when he died. So when I feel that condemnation and I feel that voice whisper and, and try to remind me, well, this is who you are and this is who you were, I can say, not anymore. Not anymore, because I've been changed. As Jesus died on the cross, he proclaimed, it is finished. Those were some of his last words. And that phrase could also mean paid in full. They actually had a stamp that they would... Uh, use on documents or on a bill or a debt or a mortgage and when it was finished they would stamp that very phrase it is finished you're free and if any of you have ever paid off your car or a house or your credit card bill you know that's just a it's just a metaphor it's just this tiny little picture of the freedom that he brings paid in full Yesterday, I was working around the yard, and I got this song stuck in my head. You, some of you, you old-timers like me, you remember this. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Maybe you're here today, and sin has just made a wreck of your life. Maybe you've left behind you a trail of damaged relationships and pain and failures and broken promises. Maybe sin has long wreaked havoc in your life. I know. I get that. 
But I want you to know that Easter means sin doesn't have to get the last word in your life anymore. Jesus does. When John the Baptist saw Jesus approaching in the desert, he pointed at him and he proclaimed, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And through his death on the cross, Jesus destroyed the penalty of sin. And then through his resurrection, he destroyed the power of sin. You're free. That means that however sin has played with you, has tortured, tormented you in the past, you can, you can be set free. That's why Paul made this promise in Romans 6, 14. Sin shall not be your master. Not anymore. God forgives you of your sins, and then he starts you on a new path, on a new road. And you can experience these increasing levels of victory uh, in your life. And you'll experience an ultimate victory in the life to come. So I'm saying, no matter how much noise that sin may be making in your life right now, and how defeated you might feel, and no matter how often you feel like, I'm just losing this battle, I'm just going to give in, what's the use? I want you to remember that Easter means that sin never gets the last word. Jesus has the last word. One more idea about last words and how they're not the last anymore. Easter means that no enemy will ever get the last word. Paul says that Jesus will destroy every ruler, every authority, every power. In verse 25, he says, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. Now, who are his enemies? Is it other people? Because that's usually who my enemies have been, right? No, his enemies weren't people. He loves people. He died so that all people, so that the world might be saved. No, his enemies are the real enemies of this world. Sin and evil and corruption and fear and sickness and pain and misery and jealousy and greed and abuse and hate. I could go on. Every ugly thing that you can think of, these things are the enemy. And eventually, he says, King Jesus will put them all under his feet. He goes on to say, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And isn't that true? I mean, isn't at the end of the day, we do everything to avoid that? And we'll compromise and we'll, you know, we'll give up this, and we'll give up that. But that's the last enemy. That's the last thing we let go and give in to. And that causes more pain than anything else. And isn't that what makes us feel more alone and afraid and helpless and vulnerable? Death is our final enemy, and it will be destroyed. And to those without faith, life on earth may appear to be not much more than just the consequence or the se- this sequence of random events that lead us to just like a, a, a senseless journey to the grave. Do you ever feel like that? Think, what is, why are we doing this? And make no doubt, you know, that the fact is, and we can pretend that it's not true and we can avoid it, we don't want to talk about it and maybe hope it's otherwise, but we're all headed to the cemetery, all of us. Nobody gets out alive. And here's the good news. The journey doesn't have to end there. The graveyard is not your final destination. Death, along with every other enemy we face, everything that is ugly, everything that's evil, doesn't get the last word. Jesus gets the last word, even over death. Because through the power of the resurrection, he conquered it all. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Most of us in this room have seen up close the destruction that disease 
can do, that crime can do, that violence and war can do. But we, we must remember that they don't represent the final chapter of the book. In fact, here's a spoiler alert, okay? Uh, my son and I went to see the Batman Superman movie. We've got a lot of issues about it. But before we go, it's like, no, no, nobody talk to us. Don't tell us. Don't, don't listen. You don't want to read any tweets or anything because you think, no, somebody's going to give away something. Well, this is a spoiler. If you hadn't read all of Scripture, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be any mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things all passed away. That's how it ends. That's the promise. When this life is over, in spite of it all, and we know, we think, ah, I've had a good life. But our promise is that this good life, when it ends, is going to be a much better life that begins. Because it's a resurrected life, a life of peace and of joy. And we'll be in the presence of God. A life where Jesus gets the last word. So the question, I'm going to end with a question. Who then will have the final word in your life? Will it be you? I didn't mention one of the, and there's so many fascinating people when they die. Joan Crawford, who was an actress. Some of you may not be familiar with her, but um, she was very famous at one time. And on her deathbed, um, there was a lady in there attending to her who began to pray for her. And Joan Crawford shouted, don't you dare ask God to help me. And sadly, that's the way some people choose to live their entire life. And then there's this other guy I found. His name's Joseph Addison. He was an 18th century poet and playwright, sometimes politician. Uh, and his life wasn't easy. Uh, some close to him didn't treat him well. His relationships didn't always work out. Uh, he was criticized, sometimes ridiculed by others. He struggled all of his adult life with health problems. Uh, but he knew that his life wasn't all that there is and that there's no problem, no enemy, and not even death that's going to get the last word. You know what his last words were? Moments before passing into eternity, he said to those around him, See, in what peace a Christian can die. And then he left. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, while we all await that, that last day, our words can be, See, with what peace a Christian can live. I told you in the beginning that my life is so different. And it's not just because, okay, I'm going to go to heaven. So what else? The sweet thing is this, this peace where there didn't used to be any. Now there's peace. That's because we don't have to live in fear of anything that he brings our way. Your trials, your troubles, they don't get the last word. Jesus does. And neither does sin get the last word in your life. Jesus does. And death, the so-called last enemy, doesn't get the last word either. Jesus has the last word over life and over sin, over death, over all. So I ask you again, who's going to get the last word in your life? On an Easter Sunday night, I gave over the authority of my life 
I made a transfer from me to him. And in essence, I said, I want you to have the last word from this moment forward in my life about everything in my life. It's been so sweet. It's been so good ever since then. Ever since I let go of my control and gave it to him. I'm going to invite you, challenge you to, to do that same thing. To give him the last word. Watch what a difference it makes in your life. Will you stand, please?